Welcome to the next episode of the Dark Web Deacon. Before we begin, be sure to smash that subscribe button, click the bell to turn on notifications. New videos are published every Monday and Thursday. And as always, be sure to like and provide comments. So today we're gonna to talk about man in the middle attacks. A, a man in the middle attack is a general term for when a hacker positions himself in between a consumer and an application either to eavesdrop or to impersonate one of the parties, making it appear as if a normal exchange of information is underway. Metaphorically speaking, a man in the middle attack is the equivalent of a mailman opening your bank statement, writing down your bank details and then resealing the envelope and delivering it to you. You would be none the wiser. The goal of an attack like this is to steal personal information, such as login credentials, account details, and credit card numbers. Targets typically are users of financial applications, uh, or software as a service businesses, e-commerce sites, and other websites where logging in is required. Information obtained during this type of attack could be used for many purposes, including identity theft, unapproved fund transfers, or to elicit password changes through some type of phishing or smishing attacks. A successful man-in-the-middle attack execution has two distinct phases, interception and decryption. The first step intercepts users' traffic through the attacker's network before it reaches its intended destination. They can do this with Wi-Fi hotspots, IP spoofing, or DNS spoofing, just to name a few. Those are the three main ones. IP hotspots are the most common and the simplest way of doing this. Typically, a malicious Wi-Fi hotspot uh, becomes available to the public and is named in a way that corresponds to the location. So let's say you're at a Starbucks. There may be a Starbucks uh, one that's actually owned by the actual Starbucks, you know, uh, location. And then the attacker may create a Starbucks two or a Starbucks guest to try to impersonate them. And of course, these, these type of hotspots are not password protected. Once a victim connects to such a hotspot, the attacker gains full visibility to any online data exchange that they're currently doing that's not encrypted. With IP spoofing, it involves an attacker disguising himself as an application by alter, alternating or altering, that is, the packet headers in an IP address. As a result, a consumer attempts to access a URL connected to the application, but are actually are sent to the attacker's website. And finally, uh, DNS spoofing to round up the top three, also known as DNS uh, cache poisoning, involves infiltrating a DNS server and altering a website's address record. As a result, users attempting to access the site are sent uh, by the altered DNS record to the attacker's site. So let's say if a DNS record is poisoned for, you know, Mike's local bike shop, you go to mikeslocalbikeshop.com, but in reality, that DNS record is gonna redirect you to the hacker's version of Mike's local bike shop, and you're none the wiser. And potentially you log in, or you try to do some type of transaction, and you're handing over your credit card information during that transaction. Next phase is decryption, and there's a few ways that this can roll out. One way is with HTTPS spoofing, uh, which sends a phony certificate to the victim's browser using the initial connection request to secure a site. It holds a digital thumbprint associated with the compromised application, which the browser verifies according to an existing list of trusted sites. The attacker is then able to access any data entered by the victim before it's actually passed to the application. Another way is through SSL hijacking. So SSL hijacking occurs when an attacker passes forged authentication keys to both the consumer and application during a TCP handshake, which is basically a network handshake. This sets up what appears to be a secure connection when in fact the man in the middle controls the entire session. So a lot of this stuff is very low level, very underneath the covers of, of an actual application. A lot of this is occurring at the session layer or at the network layer. So it's really hard for, it's nearly impossible for a user to really be aware of this. 
And then a third option um, for the kind of unlocking the decryption phase is through SSL stripping. So with SSL stripping, basically uh, is a downgrade of an HTTPS connection to an HTTP connection by intercepting the TLS authentication sent from the uh, application to the consumer. Uh, the attacker sends an unencrypted version of the application site to the user while maintaining the secured session with the application. Meanwhile, the entire consumer session is visible to the attacker. So this is a great example of, you know, there's a Wi-Fi hotspot as part of the interception phase, and then they run through this SSL stripping, um, uh, basically methodology, so that even if you are appear to be going to an HTTPS site, they actually strip away the HTTPS to make it an HTTP connection, and then they can see everything, even though you think maybe you actually have a, sec a secure connection. So how common are man in the middle attacks? Well, th though not as common as ransomware or phishing attacks, man-of-the-middle attacks are still a threat, especially to financial companies. Uh, IBM's X-Force Threat Intelligence Index in 2018 uh, said that about 35% of exploitation activity involved attackers attempting to conduct a man-of-the-middle attack. But hard numbers are fairly difficult to come by in terms of the overall uh, cyber attack footprint that's occurring both on the surface and potentially the dark web, and what per percentage of those are actual man-of-the-middle attacks. Alex Hinchcliffe, a Palo Alto network executive, has said, quote, I would say based on anecdotal reports that man-in-the-middle attacks are not incredibly prevalent. Much of the same objectives, spying on data communications, redirecting traffic, and so on, can be done using malware installed on a victim's systems. If there's a simpler way to perform attacks, the adversary will often take the easy route." End quote. I agree with Alex on this. Aside from the danger of open and fake hotspots that can be exploited, man in the middle attacks rank very low when it comes to being impactful and present cyber risk for most consumers. While most attacks go through wired networks or Wi-Fi, it is also possible to conduct a man in the middle attack uh, with fake cell phone towers. Law enforcement agencies across the US, Canada, and UK have found, been found using fake cell phone towers, known as stingrays, to gather information in mass. Stingray devices are also commercially available on the dark web uh, for a more cunning hacker to try to exploit. So while Wi-Fi hotspots are probably the biggest thing consumers need to be aware of, potentially these Stingray devices could be an additional thing that you may have to be aware of in the future. Right now, I haven't seen any major movement in terms of any type of significant attack on consumers using this technology to date. But it's out there and it's definitely as possible to uh, be exploited. And finally, let's talk about man-in-the-middle attack prevention. Even though it is a low risk, but it still is possible with Wi-Fi hotspots and potential in the future more with some of the Stingray technology as we mentioned. So stopping man-in-the-middle attack requires several practical steps on the part of the consumer. Number one, avoid Wi-Fi connections that are not password protected. Number two, pay attention to browser notifications reporting a web, uh, that a website is not secure. Number three, immediately log out of a secure application when it's not in use. Uh, number four tip is to not use public networks at coffee shops or hotels when conducting sensitive transactions. And number five, uh, for website owners, uh, secure communication protocols are key, including TLS and HTTPS which can help mitigate spoofing attacks by encrypting and authenticating all transmitted data on your site when consumers try to access it. It is also considered best practice for applications to use SSL, TLS to secure every page of your website and not just the page that you require the consumer to log into. Doing so helps decrease the chances of an attacker stealing session cookies from a user browser on an unsecured section of the website while they're logged in. So hopefully you found this information useful on man of the middle attacks. If you have any comments, thoughts on this very complicated, intriguing, 
fairly low risk topic uh, for consumers to date, uh, please add them to the comments below. Thanks for watching, and as always, please like, subscribe, and provide comments, and turn on notifications by clicking the bell in order to check out future videos published twice a week.